everyone. Um, I, uh, before I get started, just want to thank Professor Milky, Annie Tabakian, the MD Lab, Lebanese American University. Uh, thank you all for being here at 9 a.m. Uh, an hour is a long time to speak at this hour, so I, I applaud you all for being here and um, listening. Uh, I thought I would quickly start by sharing um, what I'm going to talk about. So first I'm going to give kind of a, a sense of, of, of where media literacy is, uh, move into affect, emotion, and media, and then the conditions and framing for effective learning, uh, which I have pulled from other anti-oppressive pedagogies. Uh, because as Jad said, it tends to be a newer area of thinking within media literacy. And then looking at some contemplative practices um, that can be incorporated within uh, uh, media literacy. So uh, to begin, I thought I would ask you all um, to help uh, define for me what is media literacy. So I think you've been here for about a week now. Many of you work in the field. Um, I would love um, for you to kind of help piece together the definition of media literacy as we know it now. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and I have my headphones. So, yes. على ما تعلمنا أن التربية العالمية هي توفير القدرة على الوصول إلى المعلومات. التربية العالمية يشير مفهوم التربية العالمية بتعريفه البسيط إلى القدرة على الوصول إلى المعلومات ومن ثم تحليلها. وإنتاج أيضا وفهم الرسالة العالمية التي يحاول سائسو العقول إصالة الجمهور المتلقي. Wonderful. Yes, absolutely. So access, evaluate, understand different media outputs where information is coming from. Anybody else? Media literacy is the ability to access and act uh, using all forms of communication. And uh, one of media literacy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so why can't I hear it? Because you're speaking. I didn't. Uh, okay. uh, media literacy is the ability to access and act using all forms of communication. Mm -hmm. One of media literacy elements is critical media literacy. This skills enable the audience to produce a judgment about media content. Absolutely wonderful. So critical media uh, building off of the, the, the general media literacy uh, definition. Great. Anybody else to add to, to what we've shared? All right. So let's get started. So many of you have shared the definitions um, that I'll briefly go over. To be media literate, one must have the knowledge and the skills to access, analyze, evaluate, create, and act with media, which is exactly what we heard um, from our first speaker. This definition was developed and shared in Renee Hobbs' Digital Media Literacy, a plan to action white paper from 2010, 12 years ago. It describes the process of how to become media literate. Media literate. More than 10 years later, the National Association of Media Literacy Education, NOMLI, is still using this framework. Through the media tools, practices, formats, and modes have changed in the last decade. For example, here is how um, Hobbes is currently using the tool um, in a virtual college level course. She uses the same framework through updates and curates the platform and activities to adhere to the objectives, content, and mode. The framework is helping organize the process of media literacy. In 2009, Henry Jenkins and colleagues came up with a list of skills that needed to address three challenges. 
The participation gap between who has access to knowledge, skills, opportunities, and experience within media and who doesn't. The transparency problem, people not fully grasping the ways media shape their perspectives. And the ethics challenge to prepare people to be professionals and citizens of the world. So you can connect Hobbes' formulation of the process to the outcomes or skills Jenkins and colleagues propose. And you will notice many of the skills listed here focus on cognition, thinking, and doing. More generally, to be media literate is to be a critical thinker and a critical creator user. Many of these skills are ones 14 years later we are still supporting through media literacy practices and advocacy. In 2009, Douglas Kellner and Jeff Scher took a political approach to media literacy, pulling from cultural studies and crit critical pedagogy. They sought to develop a media literacy approach that could critically engage with the role of race, class, and gender within an understanding of power dynamics between media and users. They argue the process-oriented media literacy definition offered by Anomaly maintains an apolitical framework that does not more deeply address the oppressive power dynamics of media for the purpose of a transformative education to enhance democratization and civic participation. Critical media requires that media literate people be aware of the consumers and producers, relative power positionalities, and how values and interests of media Producers often conflict with the values and interests of people using the media, particularly marginalized communities. So to the, the second definition we got today. They point out that media culture is left out of the formal school education and socialization, but plays a major role in reinforcing behaviors, values, knowledge, and identity prescribed rules. This type of pedagogy often occurs invisibly, and calls for critical intervention for awareness on how media construct meanings, influence social uh, norms, and reinforce dominant ideologies that play a pivotal role in people's lives. We see examples of how this pressure um, uh, uh, pops up and whose identities are represented on television shows, how beauty gets reinforced in fashion ads, and how misinformation about health gets spread through direct messaging apps like WhatsApp in, or group chats. Behind these representations and practices are large, powerful media companies like Netflix and Facebook. Critical media literacy helps make visible the linkages and the context between media culture and industry and promotes alternative means of production and use. Instead of a framework, they provide reference points for creating strategies to support critical inquiry and analysis, combined with alternative media-making practices. The reference points come from media and cultural studies, feminist studies, and critical pedagogy. Kellner and Scher sought to move beyond the media literacy focused on technical skill building without critical attention to values, interests, ideological implications of media usage, because of how it perpetuates uneven power dynamics and participation gaps between capitalist elites and marginalized groups. As Kellner stated, quote, media are powerful tools that can liberate or dominate, manipulate or enlighten, and it is imperative that educators teach their students how to critically analyze and use media, end quote. Critical media literacy supports people's empowerment and equips them with the thinking and skills to push against those structures of oppression for a more just and equitable future. Today, I propose that critical thinking and doing are important components of media literacy and that I am too advocating for critical media literacy. However, thinking and doing must be combined with other competencies that address the emotional and behavioral connections to media and media's intermediary role and in how people perceive and experience the world. Since the 2016 US elections, as the public became more concerned with fake news, sharing of private information, political polarization, and non-transparent media industry practices, there has been a rise in attention given to media literacy as the quick fix solution. Media literacy advocates have demonstrated that a media literate public cannot solve large political, economic, social, cultural, infrastructural issues alone. 
Yet they have also revealed how media literacy has fallen short in supporting people to actively participate in a media-saturated and a media-dependent world. For example, technology scholar Dana Boyd argues that media literacy perpetuates public uncertainty and distrust because fundamentally, it is a form of critical thinking that asks people to doubt what they see. What they, what they see. She proposes that media literacy approaches can be co-opted to, quote, assert authority over epistemology, end quote, deciding what is true and who is reliable, as opposed to trusting media and education institutions conventionally at the center of public knowledge production. Paul Mihaldis makes the argument that because of this increased distrust, as well as partisanship and tribalism, media literacy interventions must be redesigned as purposefully civic, meaning the media literacy must be situated within a world that promotes social good on and offline. A media literacy that focuses too much on what is wrong with media can lead people to feel cynical, apathetic, while too much focus on the use and creation can lead people to perpetuate false assumptions that media engagement is a value-free, neutral process. Through social media and online platforms, people show constant and immediate concern by liking a cause and reposting and sharing articles. Yet, education scholar Harry Boy asserts that education needs to bridge the gap between concern and capacity to act. Media education scholar Paul Mihaldis takes this a step further, arguing that the proliferation of information and ease of communication has helped propel an agency gap, in which media education in its current state only partially addresses. To tackle this agency gap, he proposes that media literacy must be value-based because it, quote, cannot be removed from the larger value systems that guide how individuals understand and approach their sense of place in the world and in their direct communities, end quote. We saw this with Professor Lopez's um, presentation yesterday. Mihaldis proposes five constraints with the current model of media literacy that focuses on critical thinking and doing in our current digital era. First, it presupposes one can maintain distance from the media to objectively discern it as opposed to understanding the connected and comprehensive landscape we currently inhabit. Second, current media literacy practices are transactional, meaning one achieves the critical thinking and doing skills to reach fluency, as opposed to becoming a lifelong learner. Third, media literacy is often understood through a deficit-focused lens, meaning that to be media literate means one has the ability to deconstruct and find fault. Fourth, media literacy often focuses on content, the ability, to de um, the ability to do analysis and the production, as opposed to the platform, mode, or technology, um, which means it gets less attention uh, paid to algorithms and flows of information. Fifth, media literacy prioritizes individual responsibility, meaning that we must all become um, individually responsible for how we engage with media. And the media literacy is the solution that enables us to combat fake news and misinformation and be responsible for how we navigate and engage with and use different platforms. Instead, as we know from our critical media literacy experts, individual media literacy alone can't dismantle oppressive practice structures. Nonetheless, my health is explains that to reform media systems and structures, people must move from critical inquiry of how those systems work to civic imagination, which he explains is the capacity to imagine alternatives to the current social, political, and economic conditions. He advocates for media literacy as a social and communal endeavor as opposed to an individual one that promotes and supports the common good. To do this, he proposes five constructs, which he argues are value-oriented, through which the process of media literacy can be carried out. These constructs are care, persistence, critical consciousness, emancipation, and imagination. And so you see he puts a, a layer of value around the process-oriented definition I started with. The last three critical, consciousness, emancipation, and imagination can be found in Kellner and Scheer's formulation of critical media literacy. They're not so clearly laid out. 
But I want to spend a little time talking about care, which is a newer addition to thinking about media literacy. To understand our responsibility to one another, for one another, the lens through which we analyze and make media shifts. Mihailis points out that through deconstruction of social, political, and economic media formulations and texts, we learn to care about issues and events, but not necessarily the communities and people. He states, quote, the more we use technologies that remove us from human elements associated with these presentations, the further away from a focus on interdependence and related embeddedness, end quote. His human-centered intervention to the process of media literacy shifts the focus from a predominantly one that focuses on thinking and doing and one that embraces how values impact one ways of thinking and doing. After reviewing all these frameworks for media literacy, I think it's time to go through the process ourselves. Um, we're going to watch a short film together. Uh, it, uh, very little English is in it. You can watch it without actually reading, um, and I think you'll be able to pick up the, the entire story. English is, 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 isn't used very much. Um, in many ways, it's kind of like a silent film. Um, I'm going to play it's the 2019 animated Oscar-winning short called Hair Love.
Okay, time's up. Uh, question two. How did you feel while watching it? How did you relate to it or not? How did it move you or not? Did you have a physical reaction? If so, what was it? Okay, number three, what messages did you take away from this film, or what themes did you uncover using a lens of care when analyzing or deconstructing the film? How do the values in this film connect, or not, with your own values? Ten more seconds. Um, anyone interested in sharing? Um, we're going to share in a bit. Okay. So uh, put this on. Yes, hand raised in the back. resonated with me because I had a very personal connection to it. Um, I have curly hair myself and it took me a while to, to accept it, and learn how to love it and treat it and even uh, appreciate uh, the gray hairs and everything about it. So um, yeah, it warmed me up because um, it's not like in this region, uh, girls and boys predominantly would have curly hair, but we are not taught to love it, we are just uh, given the the mainstream uh, standards of beauty that are straight hair, uh, blonde. I'm blonde, but not not that long. But I was not uh, taught to love my hair as it was, and I was not taught how to treat it to for it to be beautiful. So very deep connection. Absolutely, yeah. So I, I can definitely see how this kind of uh, 
this story takes place in the US, young girl, it transcends, right? Because um, uh, ideas of beauty transcend, um, absolutely. Here, in the middle. Yeah, so she was saying um, that you have a niece, right? Was it a niece who has curly hair and for the family they're, they're, uh, they're working through how to accept it because part of it is the work. And I think both of you pointed to that, right? There's a work um, and I think the video shows that work, right? It's part of the process. Uh, what about, oh, yeah. Uh, second question. Any thoughts on how did you, anyone want to share how they felt, how they physically reacted? That one's harder to share. Yes, in the front. Hello, I get emotional because I have tears in my eyes. I have uh, many cases in my family that face the uh, same issue. Uh, it's very important that family support for the, uh, in the cases, yeah. It's like a lot. Yeah, so you got emotional while watching that and you felt connections to your own family life, yeah. I also felt connection to my family just due that my father used, used to help me a lot when I was a little girl. He used Not to in the hair stuff, but in get, getting dressed, giving me a shower, bath. He was the one around, so yeah, I got uh, emotional. So emotional because of the connection or the relationship between the father and the daughter, yes. Uh, I had a connection especially because uh, when I was young, my dad usually uh, braided my hair and <laughs> it's what It wasn't my mom. That's why when I saw the dad uh, fixing the little daughter's hair, I was uh, in tears and I remember that. Yeah, so that being a total norm, right? So the, the, we don't see that commonly outside, but within our own families, and that, that, that is emotional to acknowledge, some, right? The acknowledgement of something that, that exists for you or for your family um, is, in, is, in, in, is, is there on the big screen, absolutely. All right, the last question, and I do want to point out that often that second question, that's like harder to answer, right, out loud. And my, I'm curious for you all how it felt to write it down, um, but sharing it in a group um, with others isn't something we're used to doing, and especially in a formal classroom space uh, when you have a guest speaker and, that you don't know in, in front of you. Um, the, the third question, what messages did you take away from this film? Uh, one of the messages is uh, self-reconciliation and uh, uh, to accept ourselves. Uh, whatever uh, our shapes uh, were, and also in this movie, uh, it touched the emotions and it uh, tried to change the behaviors of the audience. Uh, we can, uh, as we uh, we uh, watch, the daughter uh, inspired her mom, and at the same time, the mom inspired her daughter. Both of them accepted themselves as uh, they were. So that's it. Yeah, that's a great point, that they both accepted themselves in that movie, right? That, okay, so we see that value. And the behavior change, as you pointed out, too, right? She takes off her hairpiece. easy, we get to do it, we see that it's hard, then 
and then we get to the top of the, the climax, you see. Uh, then after a while it starts, you know, we, we find the solution after accepting it. You know, it takes time to accept and find a problem for the solution. Maybe love and uh, uh, love and acceptance is the main key to solving a problem. Yeah, so love and acceptance, and also I think what you were describing too, persistence, right? So there was the persistence we saw. Last one, yeah. Uh, I think there are many messages that can we, we can read from the short film. Uh, first of all, the effect of uh, electronic communities, for example, the YouTube and the yeah. this effect for caring. Uh, love and how love makes it easier. Also the cancer uh, or the, the mother, how uh, we can make it easier for them, but the cancer uh, survivors and uh, their own uh, life and issues also, uh, to how to give more care to them. There are many messages that we can uh, have from this short film. Yeah, absolutely. So caring, um, caring for family members. Um, and then I, I wanted to, to, to pause on your point about the use of technology and media in there. I think what's really, right, we, we like surprised that the woman in the video ends up being her mom. And I think that's a really important uh, message and, and something to think about in the fact that um, there's, an, there's a body, there's a person, right? So often when we think of videos and we think of you know interaction with media, we don't think of the person on the other side as a, as a human. Um, and so I, I think this one does a good job kind of surprising us in that way to remind us about kind of that that, that embodied experience, even when while you're using media. Absolutely. Okay, I better shift for timing, but if you want to share when we get to questions, feel free to do so. Um, Can we take one more response? Okay, one more, one more. <laughs> no, I'm good. Go for it. Uh, very quickly, I wanted to uh, reflect on the race element, in fact. Yeah. Uh, probably this was the first time I'm watching an animation where all the characters were not white, yes. and uh, I mean, I'm not black, but I'm also not white, and so it's so refreshing to see a representative sample, uh, people who look like us, or may think like us, or have the same hair of us, and so I think the representation and the diversity is also quite encouraging, uh, and could be inspiring for us to uh, portray some messages from our own communities. Absolutely, that's a great point, and it's, um, within the US there is a, a problematic stereotype of uh, the, the black father leaving, not being home, right? And so this movie uh, pushes back against that um, and, and, and is, is, is really important in that way as well. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to take this off. So clearly, these questions were not the traditional set of questions you get when deconstructing media. I want, to, I want you to think about Mahalis' inclusion of values within media literacy practices, but that's not all. I also want to argue that media literacy must take into account the emotional response or affect that circulate through, these me through media usage. This is why I asked you the first two sets of questions about your reactions, your feelings, how you related or were moved by the film. Information and messages aren't the only transmissions taking place. How can emotion and affect dynamically flow and transform individuals and relationships, publicly and privately? Whether it's a 280 character tweet, a TikTok video, a work email, or an Oscar winning film, media and, its and the use of it invoke emotions. And while media literacy experts are still pushing for the process to become more central within formal education systems, I think these frameworks miss out by not acknowledging the pivotal role emotion plays in everyday media engagement. I would argue in a parallel way, formal education often tries to maintain a distinction between thinking, cognition, and emotion in ways that can often be inhibiting to the learning process. I'll get to this in the next section when I discuss pedagogical strategies and, co and considerations for integration of emotion and affect in the media literacy process. But first, I want to provide some context on media and its relationship to affect and emotion. What do I mean by affect and emotion? And Jad reminded me it's not effect with an E, it's affect with an A. Um, are they synonymous? 
There is no universally shared definition of the terms, unfortunately, um, in the field of social and cultural research, and they are often grouped together, though there are some theoretical efforts to separate them. Um, while scrolling different definitions, this was the one I thought that was like the simplest to put, to, uh, to put out to, to share with you all. Uh, as Stephen Shaviro explains, quote, if emotions are personal experience, then affects are the forces, or the flows of energy, that precede, produce, and inform such experiences. Affect is pre-personal and pre-subjective. It is social, or even ontological, before it is strictly individual. Affect isn't what I feel so much as what it forces me to feel. In 2014, a controversial study was published by Facebook and Cornell University on their experiment, uh, experiment with 600,000 user accounts on emotional contagion. They determined that emotions could be contagious, meaning that if one received mostly negative posts in their feed, they were more likely to post something negative. And if they received mostly positive updates in their feed, they were more likely to post positive updates. The efforts to emotionally trigger mass contagion was seen as controversial because of Facebook's role and motives to partake in this research, as well as the lack of ethical guidelines and methodology for producing consent from the users. Nonetheless, this study did help draw attention to how media can be used, created, curated, and curated to manipulate emotion and thus consumer practices such as micro-targeting, and political practices such as election outcomes. Media scholars um, Lindenberg and Meyer emphasize the importance of including affect in media communication studies because it, con uh, quote, contributes to the social formations, sense of belonging, and constitutions of identity. Their rationale could be uh, applied to the inclusion of affect and emotion theories within media literacy. To foster mindful media users outside of the formal academic discourse. This inclusion enables people to connect affect and emotion to structures of power and inequalities on individual and social levels and has practical ramifications on their media participation. On the individual level, supporting people and how they receive and respond to media better equips them to engage in meaningful ways within their social milieu. On the social level, effective engagement with people through media helps prevent othering and fosters positive social interactions through media. By viewing Hair Love together as a small community, we created a mini media event. We experienced the film together, felt the experience of the community, exchanged verbally our thoughts, relations, and connections to it. And although we each had an individual relationship to the film that was different, we also experienced a social one. We can go online and post tweets about it. You see here the film was also made into a book. And this post here from Imbram Kendi, and the one above is from someone who saw the film. Also note, these are from 2019. So while our mini media event took place in May 2022, we are connected to those who saw it in the theater in May 2019. The film is available via YouTube, so anyone can stream it anytime with access to YouTube. And as Abram Kenji points out, it's a book as well. Um, we have transcended the temporal and national borders to view this film and have multiple platforms and modes to get this story. Um, I'm gonna point out too, I didn't notice in my first view, a couple of viewings of this until I read the YouTube um, conversation underneath that uh, the mother's hair is growing back in the very last scene, right? And so I wouldn't have even known that had I not engaged with more information because upon my first viewing, um, it wasn't something I noticed. For these reasons, Lisa Blackman argues for an ecological approach to understanding the relationship between affect and media as social versus individual, because media events and social media interactions are multiplicitous, layered, distributed, and generative, she says. 
From viral Twitter messages to clickbait, hashtag campaigns to intense Facebook exchanges, information alone does not circulate and flow, but so does affect and emotion. We have seen the role of emotion and affect play out in important ways, like Arab Spring or Black Lives Matter in the US. How can we incorporate capacities to process emotion and affect in ways that make connections between the individual experience and the relational or societal experiences? Just as social media flows have embodied um, consequences that play out in these movements, they also manifest individually. So for example, Stephen Jukes produced a case study on how user-generated content has changed the historically safe environment of a newsroom. He interviewed staff about their experiences combing through user-generated content. Whereas historically, content was prepared by a journalist out in the field and brought back to the newsroom in a curated way, now anyone can send their images, videos, and audio files. For those responsible for the social media, often the entry-level journalist, they are constantly coming into contact with a barrage of horrific images that are affecting their mental health. While this example is specific, and perhaps one that may resonate with some of you as journalists in the room, we can probably all come up with an example of a time when we saw an image or a video that caused us a bodily or emotional reaction stayed with us after we turned off our phones, and perhaps even impacted our behavior. The relationship between social media and mental health has been unclear and often, un and often contradictory. I keep thinking about what Professor Lopez said yesterday about not being able to find um, whether or not a phone causes cancer. And I'm like, in like similar ways, we can't like come to an agreement on the relationship between mental health and social media. Um, in 2020, uh, they re uh, they, uh, a review of research on the relationship between mental health and social media um, was conducted, and the findings showed that social media negatively contributed to anxiety, depression, loneliness, poor sleep, thoughts of self-harm and suicide, increased psychological distress, cyberbullying, body image dissatisfaction, fear of missing out, and decreased life satisfaction. The study also found positive effects, including um, accessing health experiences and expertise, managing depression, emotional support and community building, expanding and strengthening offline networks and interactions, self-expression and self-identity, and establishing and maintaining relationships. And while I am by no means a health expert, I am interested in understanding how media literacy approaches can do a better job incorporating affect and emotion to promote the emotional support and community building, expanding and strengthening offline networks and interactions, self-expression and self-identity, and establishing and maintaining relationships. You will notice this list includes a set of both individual and social relationships or social effects, I should say. Effects with an E. <laughs> so how do we bring this into education? We have two challenges. The first being that media literacy itself is still on the outskirts of formal education, where more strides have been made recently. And the second is that emotion and affect are only marginally addressed and often avoided within formal education as well. So how do we see this play out? Well, one way uh, it plays out is we tend to avoid it. Educators avoid using controversial, contentious, traumatic, violent material that make illicit emotions or affective responses, particularly if they're trying to maintain a separation between the intellectual and the emotional. This works as a form of censorship, not enabling people to use the educational space as a way to process and make sense of emotionally charged material they encounter outside of their educational spaces. Kellner and Cher refer to this as a protectionist approach, meaning to shield people from the dangers of media content or practices and problematically reinforce the decontextualization and oversimplification of our relationship to media. As they point out, quote, when the understanding of media effects is contextualized within its social and historical dynamics, then issues of representation and ideology are extremely useful to media education, 
to explore the interconnection between media and society and information and power, end quote. It's challenging to come up with ways for dismantling structures of oppression if we are shielded from encountering them. I would go even further. The educational space is an important space through which to contextualize the heated political arguments that take place on Facebook um, and black and brown people experiencing police brutality via videos circulating Twitter. But that contextualizing is not just informational. It must also include the emotional and affect that occur through encounters with such media. And depending on one's identity, that's going to be very different. Another way it plays out is on the opposite side of the spectrum, um, and it's through provocation. When an educator uses an intense image, for example, to provoke emotion and effect, to make a point without the space to contextualize and process what is shared, well, provocation is an important tactic in certain circumstances. It can often limit learning as opposed to generate more in an educational space. Showing the brutal murder of George Floyd by police or presenting tweets about sexual assault without the pedagogical rationale and framing can do more than just limit knowledge. It can reproduce harm. So how do we create the educational space that isn't protectionist or simply provocative, but one that enables the media literacy process to productively take shape for social good and radical democracy. I have looked at some anti-oppressive educational approaches that takes into account the emotional and effective considerations necessary when engaging in emotionally charged media texts and media experiences. Um, and so I wanna begin with my, my favorite, my favorite scholar activist, Bell Hooks, in her book, Teaching to Transgress. Um, she says, engaged pedagogy begins with the assumption that we learn best when there is an interactive relationship between the student and the teacher. As leaders and facilitators, teachers must discover what the students know and what they need to know. And this discovery happens only if teachers are willing to engage students beyond a surface level. As teachers, we can create a climate for audible learning if we understand the level of emotional awareness and emotional intelligence in the classroom. So see, she's making the linkages between emotion and intelligence here, which I think is really important. And she's also understanding as a community experience. So how do we do this? How do we create this climate? Um, to do this, I will discuss uh, two, two specific things right now, which is how do we set the conditions for it, and how do we frame it? When discussing educational spaces, I like to refer to them as brave spaces, not safe spaces. Though I believe safe spaces are important in one's life, I don't believe the educational space is a safe space because learning requires pushing beyond boundaries of comfort, normalizing difficulty, distinguishing between people and ideas, and clarifying that the purpose of dialogue is mutual understanding, not winning a debate or convincing everyone to agree, and acknowledging intent and impact. A brave space allows learners to engage with one another in the material thoughtfully, to converse with honesty, sensitivity, respect, and generosity, while acknowledging that discomfort is part of the experience. Educators are often eager for the space just to emerge, but it often takes work uh, to construct this actively with students. Teaching with and about media stretches students intellectually, can be affectively or emotionally charged, and impacts people's social connectedness, sense of belonging, and trust. Constructing the conditions for students to speak in a draft mode, for example, to offer an opinion that diverges from the majority, to share personal connections to subject matter, and to be open to learning material that may conflict with what they know, believe, and experience outside of the education space requires educators to frame their material thoughtfully. Australian education scholar Sharon Stein proposes three sets of conditions that we should account for the intellectual, the effective, and the relational. Many of us think about the intellectual first. What prior learning might students or I need to engage with the material and develop the skills? But perhaps less obvious um, sometimes are the affective and, and relational conditions. 
Stein pushes us to ask, for example, when designing a learning process, how do I honor expertise while making room for different forms of knowledge? Preemptively, what I might ask myself, what anxieties, insecurities, fears, and assumptions might be related to the material I am sharing with the group of people I am sharing it with? And how do I create a community of learners that are accountable to one another and the media I share and what it represents in class? Using the lenses of care and critical consciousness provided, proposed by Milhaitis is an important to frame and contextualize the media you share within social, cultural, and historical landscapes. Not only the social historical framing, but also the some acknowledgement that media being shared could incite emotional responses. First, naming that emotional responses are allowed, common, normal, and that they can be incoherent, diverse, fluid, and relational is important. And second, making space to pause, reflect, and engage with media and one's relationship to it and the network uh, networked society it interacts with is important for processing, as well as for transferring that process outside of educational spaces. One way educators and activists are doing this emotional framing is by providing what is commonly referred to as trigger warnings or content warnings before they share contentious, graphic, or triggering media content. There have been heated debates about trauma and trigger warnings as useful and productive in formal education spaces, which only furthers the point that educational spaces circulate affect and emotion. Some argue trigger warnings fall under a protectionist practice of shielding students from individual trauma, and they cause self-censorship, meaning educators are worried about showing potentially triggering content. Additionally, some point out that they exist for the privileged few who can control their encounters with violence, and that they, co and that, um, they color triggering content as unique as opposed to part of everyday racism, sexism, and homophobia. Proponents of trigger warnings say they make learning more accessible and help students better engage with social problems. Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies professor Julie Kubala cogently states, quote, the idea that students should leave their drama at the door to become the appropriate disembodied subject is crucial to this critique, end quote. Kubala argues that specific disciplines like her own, which address gender and sexualized violence, are more affective than others and tend to be frequented by students who try to make sense of their own personal experiences with oppression. I think the same can be made for media educational space as well, in which people are trying to make sense of their personal relationships and experiences with and through media. The challenge, Kabbalah argues, with the current understanding of trigger warnings are that they are positioned in a way to support and protect the individual's emotional relationship to the content, and thus they depoliticize the legacies of trauma caused by structural oppression. She poses the question, quote, how do we attend to students' histories of violence, both interpersonal and systematic, in ways that do not emphasize one sort of oppression as more real than others, and that allows us to highlight their implication, end quote. She argues that being able to open up the space for political analysis of emotion enables us to connect the individual to the social because it allows us to conceptualize how feeling differently can contribute to calls for justice as opposed to diluting them. She advocates for educators to do more than cultivate sympathy, which is an individual solution to structural problems, but to utilize feelings to intensify the work and to dismantle structural oppression. Ramsey Fawaz proposes that the use of affective curation to organize a set of productive encounters with pain and trauma can expand students' feelings in order to encourage investment in attending to issues of structural oppression. He argues that educators and learners should work towards being accountable to feelings, acknowledging that emotions can, quote, help and harm our investment in justice, end quote. The origins of trigger warnings come from a woman of color activist calling for collective healing, according to Andrea Smith. 
But within elite educational spaces like universities, and part of the argument for why they only exist in privileged spaces, is that because the language is used is often so individualizing. Just as educators frame and contextualize the informational content historically, politically, and culturally, they should also frame the space as one of affective circulation, and that we must be accountable to our own feelings, those of our peers, and the sensitive nature of the media we may present. Another consideration for affective conditions um, to process media literacy is to change the frame through which we share um, and in which ways not necessarily to center, but not necessarily to also re-exploit. So for example, in Sadia Hartman's beautiful experience and experiments, she engages with a photograph of a young, naked, unnamed black girl from the turn of the 19th century that she chooses to write about, but purposely does not reproduce the image. She writes, quote, was it possible to annotate the image, to make my words into a shield that might protect her, a barricade to deflect the gaze and cloak what has been exposed? Her words protect the girl from more gazes, but she also makes space for her with her words that she can connect to structural racism and sexism that provides the reader the opportunity to intellectually and effectively engage with her story. The absence of the photograph is more radical than the reproduction of it. This may take the form of trigger warnings and it may take the form of something else like we've seen with Hartman, but acknowledging that media literacy must take place in a brave, state, a brave space that takes designing um, is important when thinking for what the role of affect and emotion um, can play in a learning process, particularly within a values-based social justice approach invested in social change. I'm now going to shift from an anti-oppressive um, approaches to creating the conditions and framing space for active affect and emotion strategies that can be used for people to engage with their emotions and learn about their own relationships to media. I'm turning specifically to contemplative pedagogical practices or, and approaches. As smartphones and social media have become ubiquitous, they are affecting young people's mental health and ways of socializing. According to uh, psychologist um, Jean M. Twain, the current generation of young people across race, class, and gender lines is less likely to experience physical danger, but more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety in comparison to previous generations. The current generation is also less likely to engage with friends than the previous generations and more likely to spend significant time alone. Twain discusses how young people worry about being left out when they witness others having fun online due in part to the constant and immediate communication and information. Mihail this discusses young people's self-consciousness among peers when posting opinions online in an increasing polarized environment. He explains that certain online practices such as meme culture and hashtag activism facilitate an ecosystem where yelling and vitriol are favored over reason and reflection. In fact, there is little to no time for reflection at all. So that's what I want to talk today about is, is where and how do we build reflection in. Contemplative practices have been advocated as coping mechanisms for media-induced stress and anxiety. Contemplative practices include solitary observation, reflection, meditation, yoga. Um, simultaneously, educators have been adapting contemplative practices into contemplative pedagogy to benefit students' interpersonal and intrapersonal capacity building. Contemplative pedagogy scholar Arthur Zanuck explains, that the theory of education that underlies contemplative pedagogy is one that presumes that the capacities to sustain voluntary attention, emotional balance, insight, and compassion are able to be developed in practice. By incorporating contemplative practices into media literacy, students can develop these practices to manage their relationship to media and their relationships with each other. We had time? Four minutes, okay. All right, so I'm gonna just show you some of the examples of this work being done. So this, this comes out of University of New Hampshire, Ke Kevin Healy. What he does is he creates these envelopes 
uh, where he takes an image, an image, um, uh, a, a, you know, a horrific or a, a feeling-induced, emotional-induced image, he puts it in an envelope, he gives them a word, and he gives them instructions, and then he asks his students to go out into the woods on a walk by themselves and to sit with that image. They sit with the image, um, they, uh, they reflect on that image, and then he gives them a map in which they are supposed to then walk with that image um, and experience how they're thinking about it in the walk experience. They then come back and blog about it. Um, and he's created a story map, and I have the website here you can see, um, where, uh, where you, can, you can look at the digital version of this. So for him, it's not about getting rid of media, um, it's about thinking and processing and pausing. So how often do we swipe through images? Um, what happens when we actually take that image and pause? Another um, example comes out of, oh, I did cite this one. Um, uh, Levy, Levy uh, does a lot of work around thinking about contemplation um, and uh, media uses, David M. Levy. Um, and he has created a set of self-observations. Um, and so there's a bunch of different ones um, that you can do on your own or you can bring into a class. And so an example in the first one is um, to actually sit and observe how you're using social media or email. So take, you know, do, the, do it, practice it, um, and then observe. What are you doing? How are you sitting when you're doing it? Um, how are you feeling when you're doing it? And write that down. And then do it for a couple weeks. Look at the patterns. Um, do you have a bad habit of scrunching up really tightly when you're like scrolling through a feed? Um, and then after kind of figuring out your own log, uh, create personal guidelines for how to conduct practices in healthier ways. And then the, the, important, the point that I think is really important in the end is, is share that. Do this practice with others. Bring it into the classroom. Make it not an individualistic practice, but one which you, you talk with others. And then the last one, which is more extreme, and I ask everyone to try it, is to go 48 hours unplugging. So get, getting rid of technology and seeing how that feels. And you would do the same thing. So you would perform the practice of unplugging, and then you would observe what you are doing and feeling. So what is it like the phantom vibration? Are you having phantom vibrations if you've unplugged? Um, and then after you've written down that log of how you're feeling over those 48 hours, review it. Ask yourself, are there patterns? Are there things that have changed? Um, and then of course, share this with others. So here are just a few examples of different types of contemplative practices that, that I think can be integrated into a media literacy. And then the last side, I just want to remember that while these practices may feel very individualistic, they still exist within that larger framework of thinking about our internal relationship to media, our relational, our institutional, and our structural. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the lecture. It was insightful. I just, <laughs> I was wondering, um, well, in the US lately, a lot of the news has been about how even when teachers want to teach things that um, are effective, uh, primarily I'm talking about um, critical race theory or just the history of racism in America in general, they get stopped by, um, laws by government officials, by parents, by PTA associations. So um, I was wondering how you could juggle that. That's it. Thank you. 
Yeah, that, that's a great, that is a, a massive issue that's taking part in uh, parts of the U.S. right now where um, they're starting to censor uh, a whole fields. And so thinking about, um, thinking about how, how we make space for it, um, and part of it is making space for the conversation. You know, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is explaining what it is. What is critical race theory, right? It's not as scary as it is. The other is taking it away from those that have co-opted it that will never want to know what it is, that they are using it as a way to kind of separate out um, um, uh, their own agenda. And so I think for those on the fence or have no real understanding of it, um, you know, the, the trick is to have, or the, not trick, but it's to have dialogue, to be able to talk about it, to engage in these conversations, um, and to kind of build a larger, a larger um, set of people who, who, who know and understand um, what it is. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, one of the keywords that uh, you repeated many times in your presentation was about critical and critical thinking in uh, media literacy. How we can make balance between uh, um, giving uh, critical thinking and uh, keeping people from taking facts after a while. For example, uh, we uh, all faced in the era of Corona, many people that everything is uh, a myth and uh, Corona is not, does not exist and uh, all this uh, news uh, taking it in a critical way. How we can make balance between these two types of thinking? Yeah, I know that's a, I think that's a great point and that's a really good example um, about why we need to put these together. So what, um, so false health, misinformation around health, right? So getting vaccines, figuring out how to, to best um, um, uh, a deal with COVID-19 are good examples of where we've seen a lot of misinformation um, go out. And so one of the best things to do is to acknowledge, I would say, and to make the argument that it's not just information because information alone is misinformation. Having conversations with people, learning where they get information, why are they scared of a vaccine, why might they be scared of a, a shot, um, getting to know kind of the, the, the feelings and the emotional aspects um, of this and also, you know, sharing that socially kind of helps build um, community and, and conversation around this, I think. Hi, I have the mic. Hello, I know everybody wants coffee, so I'm gonna make a really brief comment. If you have any reaction, that's fine. I do think that there's a value in the presentation this morning in terms of thinking both for media making and also the media literacy classroom. Having worked in this region for four years, having been a solidarity activist, activist anti-imperialist, pro-Palestinian activist for some time also working in the West, I do know that when we live and we teach and we work and we produce media in a region that's at the front lines, of war, imperialism, and colonialism, we often get news that is, you know, tear-jerking, like every moment, it emotionally very heavy. Look at your feeds now. It's an emotionally heavy feed. So I think it's very important to be mindful of the kind of media that we're making, and I know that indigenous activists, uh, media makers, for example, in Canada, some of them in their stations, in their home communities, that have been decimated and destroyed and, and now they're in the process of reviving because of colonialism that's still alive and well in Canada today. Some of them in their news that they produce, they refuse to carry uh, negative news or sad news. Or if they do, they try to contextualize it in a way that brings people together instead of sends them off crying. So that's, that's one point from a media maker perspective and I think absolutely in our classes, we have to give our students the emotional uh, language and uh, confidence to not only produce this kind of content that's, that's hard to watch, but also to help our audiences learn with it. And so of course we have to present material in such a way that students can learn through their emotions uh, in the classroom and to do it in a mindful way. And I think you provided us a lot of resources for doing that, and I'd be happy to share with anyone about how we're doing that in classes here at LAU. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would just, yeah, I think the media making side is an important part of this, um, and anything that happens in the classroom, um, it's 
media thinking, media making, and, and media uh, emotions. Thank you for that question. Well, just before you leave,